Hello. Welcome to our 11 o'clock online worship service at First Christian Church. Uh, if you're joining us for the very first time, my name is Pastor David Turner. I'm going to be joined today uh, by our worship pastor, Brian Nixon, and we also have uh, members of our band here. Uh, Eric Brotherton is uh, on guitar. Rick Hesse is on bass guitar. Evelyn Gilpin is here to provide some vocals. Ron Sadler is on drums. Also, a big thank you to our, our uh, tech wizards. Uh, Noel Brown is here doing sound today, and Scott Gibson is here helping with uh, cameras and all of the other things that we have to have to make this time work. You may know that uh, this past week, some restrictions on in-person worship services and churches were, were lifted, and so there's been a lot of questions about uh, when we'll be back together uh, for, for church in person. And, uh, of course, our goal at First Christian Church, our mission is to be and to share the good news. Uh, one of the things that we don't want to do is to share the COVID-19 coronavirus. And it turns out that in-person worship services are notorious for spreading the disease in a really quick way. Part of that has to do with the fact that when we talk or when we sing, microscopic droplets of, of uh, virus can be put out into the air. And when you're together in a space like this, uh, it, can, it can spread them real easily. And so we're still operating with the utmost caution. We're going to have a meeting this week. Some of the leaders of our church are going to get together and we're going to talk about what uh, opening might look like. But one of the things, one of our goals is to, to connect with some folks that have been disconnected. We know that there are some people that don't have internet. They aren't able to access our service online. Uh, our uh, uh, connections pastor, Kathy Kertois, is, is putting together a list of those folks. Obviously, they're not tuning in right now. Uh, but if you know somebody who uh, doesn't have access to worship, please let us know. We're going we're gonna to figure out some options for them first. In the meantime, we're going to continue to, to um, operate here online. A uh, couple of quick things as, uh, as we get started today. Uh, we, uh, we have one, one way that people can uh, access our uh, service, and that is through our KOKX radio ministry. Uh, this is something that uh, operates every Sunday morning. I think it's right around 7 o'clock. Uh, we have uh, the service from the previous week is played over KOKX radio. Uh, we have some dates available to sponsor. So if you'd like to make sure that happens for people in our community, uh, looks like we've got four or five dates uh, already that are, are that continue to be open. Please uh, check with the church office, call during the week, and we'll make sure that those get sponsored for you in honor or in memory uh, of, of someone. I uh, also want to invite you to tune in on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. I, I'm leading a pastor's Bible study. It's on the text that I'll be then preaching on the following week. And so we kind of do a deep dive into the scripture for that week. Uh, last week we started doing that as a, a, a Facebook Live premiere. Uh, so you can tune in at 6.30 and you can watch that uh, and you can share that with others uh, as well. Uh, again, we thank you for being here. It's Memorial Day weekend. This is the day that we remember those who gave the ultimate gift uh, in service to their country, protecting our freedom, including the freedom to worship. And so we are thankful for all those who serve, but especially those who have given that uh, uh, in incredible gift. And uh, so let us now enter into a time of worship. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Raise a hallelujah, my weapon is a melody. Raise a
God, we give you thanks that you are with us in all things, that you are with us here and now in this place, in all the places where we are scattered as we are, God, you are yet with us, with your presence that fills us up, that can fill any room. And we thank you, Lord, that you walk with us in all things, through all things. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to, to try to, to be your church um, in this time to be your people, faithful people, people filled with the, 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 the fruit of your spirit, God. Bless us, God, as we, as we worship now, as we go to you and worship, God, be with us, Lord. In your holy name we pray.
I'm going to begin my sermon today with one of the biggest insights into the Bible I've ever had. In fact, when I finally understood this kind of basic truth about the Bible, it changed everything for me. Unfortunately, it didn't really sink in until several years after I was ordained and already preaching. Like most people, I studied the Bible a story at a time. I I heard ministers preach about Jesus and the things he said and did. I had Sunday school teachers that taught me about Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark One of my favorite Sunday school teachers actually had us make a a tower of Babel out of marshmallows and and Elmer's glue. So I, I I knew the stories. I even had an idea of what those stories meant. But no one ever took the time to show me how all of those separate stories were part of a much bigger story. So that's the insight. I know it it sounds simple, but it's, it's really not. The Bible is one story of God seeking to be reconciled with his children. That relationship was broken right at the beginning, and we know at the very end that that relationship will be completely restored. So the Bible then, Old Testament and New Testament, is the story of God's self-revelation 
to his creation, with Jesus being the fullest expression of, of who God is for us. So if there's any advice I would give to somebody who's seeking to understand the Bible, it would be to start with the big picture and then work backwards from there. Every individual story, every individual teaching is like a, a puzzle piece that fits into that, that bigger picture. If any individual piece seems to contradict the bigger story, then you're probably missing something. You need to go back and, and look at it again. So the, the story I want to begin, uh, I want to focus on today is, is a really important piece of the puzzle with which some of us might only be a little bit familiar, maybe not at all. I'm guessing if I asked a group of, of Christians what were the most important moments in Jesus' life and ministry, I'm guessing the story that I'm going to share with you today might not even make the list. That's, that's how much attention we typically give it. Now, I'm sure that most of the highlights from Jesus' life would get included. His, his birth, his, maybe his trip to uh, the temple with his mom and dad when he was 12, his baptism, the beginning of his ministry, the calling of the disciples, probably his Sermon on the Mount, some of his miracles like the feeding of the 5,000, certainly his, his crucifixion and resurrection. But the story that I'm going to share is, again, one that, that probably would get left out and it's critical for understanding that big story and how we fit into that big story. And that is the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven. Now, I'm, I'm guessing probably not too many of you got there before I did. The story of Jesus' ascension is actually described in, in two places. Once at the, beginning, at the very end of Luke, chapter 24, and then again at the beginning of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, which is, if you haven't already turned in your Bible to that, please turn to, there, to that now. Uh, also, Acts is written by Luke. If, if Luke is part 1, then Acts is part 2. So today we're going to read the story uh, of the ascension from Acts chapter 1, which is set 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. And that number is significant. In the same way that Moses spent 40 days on the mountain in preparation of bringing the law to the people so that they would be, become the people of the law, and, and that would be where they would find their identity, Jesus spent 40 days with the disciples preparing them to become people of the Spirit, which is how we now find our identity. And uh, so let's, let's take a look at that. That, uh, again, is found in... Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, where we read, In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning, until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to, your, to, to Israel? Now, what's interesting about that, I'm going to pause here for just a minute, because uh, the, the disciples throughout their ministry, uh, throughout Jesus' ministry, uh, believed that Jesus was going to restore Israel to basically become a, a, a world power. Uh, that uh, that Israel would, uh, that Jesus would be something similar to what King David had been for Israel. That he would be a, a, a worldly king, and that he would rule over a kingdom in this world. Even though Jesus repeatedly told them his kingdom was not of this world. And yet, here we have, 40 days after his resurrection, they're still wondering if this might be the time. So Jesus replies in, in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. 
They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken away from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary the mother of Jesus as well as his brothers. Now I have to confess my first real encounter with the story of Jesus' ascension didn't come until I was in seminary. Now I, I'm sure I... I, I probably read the, the, the story before. Maybe I'd heard a, a, a sermon on it, although I don't remember. Uh, so while I was in seminary, I was taking a, a, a class on worship, and uh, we got an assignment, and the assignment was to create six complete worship services based on the church calendar with assigned readings for each week. And it just so happened that Ascension Sunday was right in the kind of in the middle of this, and of course, the week... After Ascension Sunday is always Pentecost. Those two always come together. And so I did, the, I did the assignment, wrote out all the prayers, picked out the appropriate hymns and all that. But I'm thinking I must have been working on this assignment late at night because at some point I guess it decided it, I needed a little humor in it. And so after reading the story of Jesus' Ascension, I decided I would call my proposed sermon Up, Up, and Away. Now, I think my professor might have let that one go if I had not titled my Pentecost sermon for the next week, What Goes Up Must Come Down. I think he thought that was just maybe a little too cute. At the time I wrote that, I really didn't have much of a sense of the importance of the ascension or how that, how that fits into the bigger picture. But then I read a book by uh, an author named N.T. Wright called Simply Jesus that helped me understand how that, that moment, the ascension, fits into the bigger story I've been talking about. As he explains, in order for Jesus to become available to everyone, everyone in the world, he had to step out of this world and plug into heaven. Jesus explains this to his disciples in John on multiple occasions, but uh, in, in one case, in John 16, he says, but I tell you the truth, it is good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The ascension then was the day that Jesus was enthroned in heaven. Or as, as I've heard people saying this week, it was the day Jesus began to work from home. I think probably some of us can relate to that. It's the day he fully assumed the role of our eternal king. And by doing so, he was able to bless us and include us in a new way. Now there's not a lot of fanfare about the actual ascension. Which may be one of the reasons we don't pay a lot of attention to it. Jesus simply spoke to the disciples for the last time. And then he was lifted up out of sight. Of course the disciples reacted about the way you'd expect. They, they stood there with their mouths hanging open staring up into the clouds. But they weren't allowed to do that for very long. Because two angels appear on the scene and basically say. Don't you have something better to do? So we read the disciples returned to Jerusalem. And for once, they did what Jesus told them to do. They waited and they prayed. It says, they returned to Jerusalem. All of the disciples with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. They waited. You might even say they sheltered in place. Like the disciples waiting in Jerusalem for those final 10 days before the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, we're also kind of in a wait mode right now. And it, it feels strange to, to most of us, certainly to folks like me who associate serving God with activity, lots of activity. Uh, now we're called upon to wait. Sometimes the most faithful thing we can do is to not do anything. Or as, as somebody once said, don't just do something, sit there. Now, of course, this shouldn't come as a surprise to us. If God is only about activity, if God is only about productivity, 
he would have never taken a day off. And he would have never called his people to do the same. So the disciples waited just as Jesus asked them to. They prayed, they, they stayed connected to each other, and they sheltered in place. So the question that I, I think we need to ask of ourselves as we read this story is, why is this story important? Why should it take such a major place in God's bigger story? And basically, the reason for us is because we wouldn't have a place in the story if it weren't for this story. We have to remember, our ancestors were Gentiles. They weren't a part of, of God's covenant with Israel. At, at the point when Jesus ascended into heaven, before that time, we weren't a part of the story yet. We were outsiders looking in. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians to Gentile Christians, right? This had been post-Pentecost. That's why he, read, he wrote, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. As 21st century believers, we've been on the inside now for so long that we sometimes forget that we weren't always a part of God's story of salvation. About half the New Testament documents the early church's struggle with whether or not to open up the church fully to people like us who didn't grow up with the law. And it wasn't an easy decision for them to make because a lot of good folks thought that new believers should have to follow Jewish law just like Jesus did and just like the disciples did. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that conversation would be like today? How politicized and divisive a discussion like that might be? But as difficult as it was, Jesus set in motion our inclusion the moment he ascended into heaven to prepare to send the Holy Spirit to us. That's what sealed the deal. That's what turned us from strangers into God's beloved children and citizens of God's kingdom. And as we'll see next week, we are called through the Holy Spirit to take that message of love and inclusion to the ends of the earth. But for now... We wait. For now, we shelter in place, praying and staying connected to others in the household of faith because we have someone in heaven who's on our side. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God that we might be included in an eternal story so that we might be called sons and daughters of the Most High. Next week on Pentecost, we'll remember that what goes up does come down. Jesus ascended into heaven that he might become available to us all and that he might dwell with us in our hearts. As always, it will be one more piece of the greatest story ever told. Amen. The Lord's Supper, this table at which we gather, is a reminder that the faith we have is a personal faith and it's a communal faith. It's personal in that, uh, that each of us has our own relationship with God. When we come to this table, we confess our sins directly to God. We don't need an intermediary. We confess our sins and God forgives our sins. We partake of the symbols independently of one another. It doesn't matter if you're off in your home. It doesn't matter if you're here. You're taking those into yourself. But this table is also a reminder that we are connected with spiritual bonds uh, to, uh, to the body of Christ, and not just in this community, but around the world. And, uh, and the symbols that we have are reminders both of that, that personal element of our faith, but also the communal also remind us that we're a part of the body of Christ at work in the world. Uh, the two symbols that we have are the bread and the cup. Um, this morning, we, we got in and we realized that we didn't have, a normal, uh, didn't have our normal loaf of bread, so Brian, Pastor Brian was able to scare up a hot dog bun. And uh, so this is what we're using for bread, but it's absolutely okay. Uh, at home, you might, be using, you might be using bread, you might be using potato chips or crackers, it doesn't matter. It is a symbol 
of God's body, of, of Christ's body, broken for us. And, uh, and as we gather, we remember how on the night Jesus was betrayed. He gathered with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body given for you. We remember how he took a cup and after giving thanks, gave it to them also and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it always in remembrance of me. coming and, and uh, joining in today uh, in our worship service. Uh, pray that you have a, a wonderful Memorial Day weekend and that you continue to join us here uh, on Sundays and, and join us again on Facebook Live on uh, Wednesday nights for our Bible study. Please share the link to our worship service. This is a real easy way to, uh, to, to be and to share the good news. Uh, maybe somebody 
needs to hear something that uh, that was uh, in our worship service today. So may God bless you and be with you now uh, in the days ahead. May God watch over you and guide your steps always. In Jesus' name.